Information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Is your money your call? Welcome to Your Money, Your Call. It's the Bonds Editions. We're on an old set, going to a new set next week, which will be made up by next week, I'm sure. I'm Mark Todd from the NAB, and I'm joined today by Keith Jones from Affinity on my left and Dan Miles from Innova. Is it Innova Capital? Or just... Innova Asset Management. Innova Asset Management. You know, I kept saying Innova, and everyone kept saying Innova, and I'm going, this is confusing me. So it's, <laughs> uh, my vernacular. They're here to answer any of your questions, and please feel free to call us. The number is 1300 30 34 35. The email is your money at skynews.com.au. Uh, thank you both for taking the time to come on the show, and I'll start with you, Keith. Uh, you and I just spoke about your business. Yep. Let, let's have the elevator pitch. You know, we get stuck in the elevator and I say, what do you do, Keith? And let's say it's a slog we shall elevator. The elevator pitch. Um, yeah, give well. us the three businesses that you're managing. And tell me about your business and some of My the My pitch is a bit long, mate, so I usually have to stop the lift to get right. the whole well, pitch. Well, no, 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 <laughs> we don't want to be stuck in the lift. We want to keep moving through. All right, so Affinity has got uh, three sections, if you like, or three divisions. We've got a, an accountancy business uh, mm -hmm. specialising in private, you know, private tax advice, corporate tax advice. We've also got a uh, financial planning and investment arm, and we've got a specialist aged care and retirement village advice piece as well. So we've got a sort of wealth management umbrella, if you like, across those sectors. All growing equally? Or are you seeing greater growth in different parts? Like, how is that? Age care is probably the fastest growth. Yeah. Yeah, but they're all growing quite substantially because they're interrelated. So, obviously, yeah. age care, retirement village advice spills into financial planning advice and investment advice. And, of course, accounting is always there. Yeah. Whatever happens. I know. So, the, the, the three the are very interrelated. I keep yeah. getting the bill in the account. Yeah. <laughs> um, Innova, uh, what, tell us about your business because it is a slightly, it's, well, it's not slightly unique, it's a really interesting business. So tell us about that business. It's a multi asset uh, portfolio management shop. Um, we have a, a particular focus on risk management and we use um, asset allocation to control for risk, but we think risk should be looked at. It's very, very different for different people and there's lots of different nuances to risk. So we build those portfolios on behalf of advisors and execute on behalf of advisors for their clients. So one of the keys to that is for you to be able to think of ways to articulate risk so that the advisor can articulate it to their client because mm -hmm. they say, I don't want any risk, I'm going to buy Telstra. And mm. you go, OK, let's start at a base case. Is that part of the challenges? You know, I think... I mean, Keith, you can tell me I'm... I'm I'm an idiot about this, but I think sometimes it's taking the the advice that you've got or the information you've got to the advisor who then has to take it to the client and at the same time not sound like they don't know what they're doing because sometimes it's trying to find the right language. Is that part of the challenge for Innova to be able to work with the advisors in a way that they're able to articulate what you describe as risk? Yeah, absolutely. It is. Um, Risk can, risk's an esoteric concept, right? Because it's a bunch of things that could happen but didn't necessarily. So it can be quite hard to understand. And trying to put it into everyday language that people can relate to. Um, and as an industry, we haven't done a great job. People talk about volatility all the time and use that as a proxy for risk. It's just a proxy. It's not actually a particularly good measure. So we try to use more relatable things like, you know, the likelihood of losing money or what's the magnitude if you do, um, you know, really relate it back to a client's goals, which is what advisors do, right? What are we trying to achieve here and what's the likelihood of achieving that? Um, and what's the variability around it so that we've got a realistic expectations of what might or might not happen? That's that's essentially what we try to do when we communicate. So, what we, I mean, you and I have spoken about this before. It, it is some of the, some of the challenges making people realise that they have got a risky uh, portfolio of investments or whatever they have when they themselves don't feel like it's risky. And, and it's trying to explain to them, OK, I mean, I was at WA talking to a, a farmer and that farmer said, look, uh, I put all my money into the business, I'm not taking any risk. Went, OK. <laughs> OK, but, and I said... And then but, he went and bought it all agricultural stocks. And yeah, <laughs> but, but I said, but doesn't, doesn't that feel that what happens if it, it goes poorly? Mm. And he said, well, 
I know it. So well, I don't feel I'm taking risk. Correct. And, and that, was, yeah. that was an interesting way of him thinking about it. And, and that resonates with me. That makes sense. I understand what he means. Yeah. He's still... That must be the greater challenge. Trying to explain to people, if you went to invest in some offshore equities with this fund manager, you're actually de-risking the portfolio and people will be going, no, 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 I'm going to that foreign land run by Mr. Trump. Yeah, well, look, it, 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 it's a valid point. Uh, people feel more comfortable with assets that they understand in mm. most cases. And, and look, a prime example of that's property, isn't it? People yeah. invest in property because they think they feel, they understand it, they feel comfortable with it. But I agree with Dan. I mean, risk, risk is, 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 uh, is more than just sitting down there and, and, and putting together an asset allocation based on a number of boxes that are being ticked by a client. It's actually an education piece. It's explaining to the client how risk actually eventuates, where it could actually sit and how it would affect their portfolio and then translate that into real moves in the portfolio. In real time in our business, we can yeah. actually move the portfolio up and down yeah. you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a concept so the client can see what we think the impact would be. And you, you can start to get a, get a feel for what type of risk that client can take. To me, that's risk management. Risk management is actually delving into the client's position, their objectives, and then you know, looking at the types of strategies you're implementing to see just how much risk is involved that they're not going to achieve those objectives. Yeah, right. That's what it's about. I was listening to a podcast last week about the turtles. Have you listened to about the turtles? No. So, you know the movie Trading Places? Yes. Well, it was actually done as a genuine experiment around that time by uh, hedge fund guys out of Chicago where they took 10 people, or 20 people, who they advertised, you know, these are the skills, and they taught them how to trade on very regimented rules. Mm -hmm. These guys have gone on, and folks, look it up, the turtles, the turtle trading. Mm -hmm. They have gone on to make hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> and in 87, they uh, shut it down and let those guys go about their business. And the podcast was on Bloomberg, and it was fascinating because the man said, basically, the rules are the rules. Once you define the rules, you can't break the rules. You, mm -hmm. ju you just have to trade to those rules. And it was interesting how he was saying, you'll get an 8% return each year and you'll have minimised the drawdowns. But he said, it's very structured. And if you don't have that mentality, mm. you are gone. You're 100% right. I was doing a conference in uh, June of last year where I got up and it was a 45-minute presentation. I spent the first 35 minutes talking about macroeconomics because that's what everybody likes to talk about. And then I said, and by the way, you can pretty much forget it all because I can't predict the future any better than anybody yeah. else. What you really need to do is follow a regimented systematic process yeah. of valuation and do it again and again and again, which is what we do, so let me tell you how we've done this bit, and that's the really boring part, which is why I did it at the end. Yeah. Um, because there's no monopoly on ways to make money, but there's a really simple way of blowing it up, and that's to guess and chop and change and go on your gut feel. And that's completely it. That's exactly right. And more important as that as well is that once you've got that strategy, you've got to understand there are periods where that strategy yeah, correct. will Nothing underperform. Is, yeah, correct. Yeah. All right? Just because the actual, the, 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 what you're trying to control, that risk component, is not working in that environment. So you just have to keep the rules to it. Yeah. When it's underperforming, I know what I'm... So you have that tight stop loss. Mm -hmm. Accept it. Take the hit, move on. How many times do people not take the hit? Yeah, and that all comes down to setting the objectives right in the first place, right? Yeah. So people understand up front. I think that's what people often don't um, take the time to understand why they're investing properly in the first place, and yeah. that's quite often where the mismatch can be. Oh, I that's think. what we call animal spirits. So yeah, we correct. see the market taking off, and I've got to be in it. I can't afford to miss it. Folks, you yeah. can afford to miss it. Trust me, you can afford to miss it. You just need to get it right. You need to right. literally. I don't know how many times I've told people on this show. So many people say to me, just get the rules. Work out what you want to do and then go for it. I've got people that I talk to who said, look, I just want 5%. And then when you say, OK, this, is, this will get you 5%, they say, well, hang on, can I take a bit more risk? And I'm, OK, well, well, hang on. do you really well, just want 5%? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's exactly... I mean, I think the premise of our firm is you should never take more risk than you have to. Mm. Yeah. You know, especially if you're a high net worth client, why, why put everything to the, to the edge? Yeah, they haven't come to yeah. you to get rich. They've come to you to make sure they're never poor, right? But alternatively, so. escaping the volatility and you sit in cash... You might have made some money, but you are not going to make any more money if you just sit in cash. I mean, well, not in cash yeah. at the moment. I mean, not, not, yeah. not that trend. Uh, what, what trends are you seeing with clients at the moment? Are you seeing, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the Trump rally, but are you seeing people losing a bit of confidence around the asset inflation? In other words, I've got $100, I've got a spare, I've got a dividend, I'm going to buy at this price, or are they going to cash because they, they're lacking trust in the rally that we've I'm got? actually not. I'm seeing... 
I don't know if it's for everybody. I'm not saying that's to do. I'm saying what are you seeing? What I'm seeing is the the fear of missing out from people. I think Mm. people are seeing returns on index numbers and they're belying what this enormous sector rotation that's actually occurred. And if they haven't been involved in the part that has gone up massively, they feel like they've missed out and they need to get involved. And I'm probably feeling that more now than I have... I don't know, in the last five years or so, it's, it, it really is coming through quite a lot on, on phone calls um, mm-hmm. and conversations. Have you seen the same thing? Uh, 100%. So, I mean, <laughs> definitely when the market starts to go parabolic like that and you've got a set strategy in place which is designed to achieve a certain outcome, there can be a mismatch between what the market's doing and what your portfolio or the client's portfolio is doing in the short term. And it's keeping the client focused on their objectives during that period that's the most important thing. Because that's when you start to make the mistakes. That's when you start to adjust the portfolio to get your little clip of the rally, and uh, which can work in the short term, but in the medium term, it usually ends up quite painful. So I am seeing a little bit of that now. I'm starting to see that. I'm also seeing a, a fair bit of complacency, to be honest with you. It's com- the two are combined. And so um, I'm not getting phone calls and I'm not getting issues, uh, but I can just see it in my client reviews just coming through at the moment. People are like, well, you know, the market's running up, the market's running up, should we put in more in equities, should we put in more in equities? You just have to be careful. There's always a time to put more in equities. It's generally not in times like this. (laughs) When the market's rallied in the way it has and vol has dropped the way it has, are you talking to clients, this is for both of you, are you talking to clients about um, options strategies for uh, using the option market to say, look, let's just take some protection. Let's take a little bit of um, money off the table for buying, whether it be an index protection, whether it be a stock-specific protection. Are you looking at buying some puts saying they're cheap? And it's very hard to find anything that's cheap. This seems cheap. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, when you get a spike like this, what you really want to do is, is one or two things, in my opinion. You can, if you're in a sector that's performed particularly well, so let's say you're in the banks or you're in the resources at the moment, Some might, particularly anyway. the banks, you might want to consider thinning your exposure. I'm not suggesting you come it's, straight out. It's not about might, timing, right? It's yes. as things get more expensive, own slightly less of them, and as they get yeah. more, own less, and as they get cheaper, you buy more. It's, it's a gradual process. I completely agree. Exactly but isn't that sort of, the, again, talking to the clients about have you got the rules? Mm, correct. Because right. the, 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 they don't seem to have the rules if they're saying, I just want to buy. So when, I, you know, a while back we were talking about the banks were offering a 10% dividend or whatever the hell they were offering. And we said, that doesn't make sense with cash rates where they are. That's not going to be... And that was when they were $10 less than what they are now. So they've rallied $10. So do you then say to customers, OK, what's your strategy for protecting uh, on the downside? And, you know, we've got equity options at the NAB. We talk to these guys and say, well... These are at multi-year lows. So we, we, I, I do agree. In fact, I, we've got some fairly complex modelling mm. that we use to build portfolios, but they are actually built on very simple principles. And there's a relatively simple principle that anybody can adopt in their portfolio, and that is when you have a really high level of confidence, like that farmer, yep. in a lot of upside in your portfolio, that's when you do what Warren Buffett calls the fat pitch. And, in fact, there's a... People can look this up. It's called the Kelly formula or the, or the, um, uh, the Kelly technique. Um, it was used by um, Ed Thorpe to learn how to, to beat the bank. He's one of the best hedge fund managers of all time. It essentially, when you have a high level of probability with a great level of success um, and a high level of upside, you take big bets. But when you're in periods now where everything's expensive mm-hmm. and you don't really have a lot of confidence in getting a great level of return, you want to take lots of smaller, intelligently diversified bets. And I mean, what's, I'm not telling people... What's the Kelly what? Uh, the Kelly formula or the um, uh, Kelly criterion. The Kelly formula or Kelly criterion? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I can get into the maths of it, but then bore, bore everyone to tears. Um, but you essentially... That, folks. We'll keep it alive. It's yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. <laughs> but it, it does boil down to, you know, um, Warren Buffett calls it the fat pitch. Um, but at times like now, you, take, you want to take more intelligently diversified bets, smaller bets, and things like taking out protection. That's exactly what we've done in our portfolios. We've taken out protection when it's... OK, Cheap. we'll take a break. We'll take our first break for the night and then we'll talk about making some intelligent bets and we'll talk about some unintelligent bets. So we'll be back soon. We'll take an ad and we'll talk to you soon. We know you've always worked hard for your money. Isn't it time your money worked hard for you? Invest with Latrobe Financial, trusted by Australians for more than 60 years 
and judged Money Magazine's best mortgage fund eight years in a row. Which small car comes with a bold new look? New Kia Rio. Osteoarthritis pain used to slow her down on holiday. Now she's on the go. This all began with Voltaren Osteo Gel 12 Hourly. Applied directly on the joint, it's the only gel that provides pain relief for up to 12 hours. Voltaren, the joy of movement. Oh, he's not well, mate. You've got to do something. Inspiration's paint. Yes. Nothing's better than sitting back admiring your just-finished paint project. Except sitting on a beach thinking about your paint project. Spend $150 on Berger Paint at an Inspiration's paint store and you could win one of five $5,000 holiday vouchers. Get some Berger Paint at Inspiration's paint stores. Centrum for Men, with adjusted levels of key nutrients like vitamin D and zinc, supporting benefits important for men, like a healthy heart and healthy muscles. Take Centrum for Men. The zip transformation of ordinary water begins with micropurity filtration. The water is then rapidly cooled in our direct dry chilling system for delicious chilled and sparkling water instantly. You can also enjoy perfectly heated boiling water with our integrated Power Pulse innovation. Only the smart technology of Zip Hydro Tap can instantly bring you water in a form you will love. All from one classically designed tap. If your goal is to retire right, AMP can help with expert advice to make the most of the super changes before July 1. Visit amp.com.au slash superchanges. It's Kitchen Week at The Good Guys. Get big brands, big appliances and big deals. Find a lower advertised price, we'll beat it. Kitchen Week is now on. Pay less, we'll beat it at The Good Guys. Should Australian companies be required to introduce a 30% gender quota? We hear the pitch from one of Australia's top female executives and you get to vote on it live. Plus all the fallout from the Dutch elections. Join me, Politics HQ, Sky News Live. Oh, I'm ready, I'm back. We've got this new studio, I haven't yet worked it out, so I'm trying to work out how to make the thing move up and down so I know what to talk to you. Uh, it's your money, your call. I'm Mark Todd. If you want to talk to me directly uh, over the course of listening to podcasts and the like, just email me. It's mark.todd at nab.com.au. Uh, joined by Keith Jones from Affinity and Dan Miles from Innova. They're here to answer any of your questions, and we have an email already, but feel free to call us. The number is 1300 30 34 35, and the email is your money at skynews.com.au. And we have an email from Ash, and Ash says, uh, Bond yields have been rising in the last three to four months. My understanding is that this should be negative for equity markets as fund managers would normally get out of the risky equities with three to four percent dividend yields and move into 10-year bonds with three percent yield. My question is around the relationship between bond prices and equity markets. Why aren't funds moving from equities yet? The equity market, as far as I can tell, is still going strong. Uh, the prices are still rallying. I think your equity broker would say, I'm not seeing the flow that I thought I would have seen at this price. Um, so can I start with you? Can you answer that one? And then I'll go to Dan, and then I'll wrap if you don't give me the answer I want. Yeah, OK. How's that? So the, uh, the reality is, is that the interest rate factor, or should we call it the discount rate, the 10-year rate is only one factor in the equation, the valuation of equities, really. Yeah. But what we're valuing is the long-term cash flow from the equity. Mm. So when we see a short-term move or an initial move in equities upwards, it's quite common for that to be happening at the same time that interest rates are moving up because we're now starting to plan for a stronger economy, plant with stronger earnings per share, coming flowing through uh, the cash flow of those companies, etc. Yep. So interest rates can move up at the same time because bond markets are also pricing in a stronger economy. The question becomes, what's the tipping point that the interest rate then starts to negatively impact on equity valuations. And now, right now, of course, equities are rallying, they're, quite, they're running quite hard, but the, uh, the, the discount rate's coming off a very low rate, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. especially in the States. So there's room for bond prices to, uh, sorry, interest rates to move without negatively impacting on, on equities in the short term. 
yeah. possibly even the medium term. Okay. I agree with Keith. And if you look at the um, the movement in uh, bond yields, so the US 10 years moved from 1.5 out to about 2.6, 2.65. Mm. In the context of things, I mean, we're only barely back to where we were in the 2013 taper tantrum. Mm. Compared to the 36-year you know, yield rally that we've seen, this is a blip in the radar. Mm. This is nothing compared to what you know could potentially happen. So... Um, Keith's exactly right. Uh, markets, particularly in the States, are factoring in. They believe um, all of Donald Trump's policies will lead to amazing economic performance, enormous tax cuts across the board, which, if you actually delve into it, will probably hurt most multinationals and maybe help domestically focused businesses, but that's a different kettle of fish. But um, here in Australia, you know, it's, it's the same sort of thing. The blowout in yields, it has not... In, on the, in the scheme of things, has not been that big, and it certainly hasn't been to the point that it is causing the discount rate on equities to be so high as for people to say, right, I need to get out of both. But it, it is a good question, though. Well, I think, actually, just, uh, I'll just highlight now, because I, I agree with Dan. He's it, had a it, rethink. The, Hang the, on. The, 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 I'm, I'm still on the same track. Right, I'm just checking, just checking. Right. The actual... I, I totally agree. I mean, even though we've had a bit of a backup in bond yields at the moment, we're still... We're still in a bond bull, really, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the range is probably up to 3% on the 10-year, and we're at, what, just under 25 at the... Yeah, 2.6%. So, unless you breach that, that, that line, and, and, you know, some people have got different lines. Bill Goss has got 2.6, others have got 3. Yeah. It looks to me like it's 3. Unless you had a meaningful break on that, you're still in trend. You know, you're not, you're not really doing any yeah, significant... And at 3, moves. you're still not getting a particularly yeah. decent... You're not getting a particularly decent premium for taking on that inflationary yeah, risk. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, a couple of things to think about this, for, as far as I'm concerned, Ash, is it's a question of trusting the sell-off. So the market is starting to distrust the sell-off. The sell-off is driven by the fact that uh, Donald Trump execution, he's going to build these uh, the walls and he's going to do infrastructure and it's going to be incredibly inflationary. So the US economy is moving strongly and the president hasn't actually got any legislation in. <laughs> so the idea of the long end being sold off was on... So that's a 10-year rate. Now, that's the key to this. Short end can go up because we want to hold back some of the economy because it's already <coughs> moving forward from a very low base to 1%. It's the long end, what happens there. Now, there is a... It's, it's a question of do you trust that sell-off because you think there will be inflation and Donald Trump will be able to be the inflationary driver around his policies. Now... That's why the market hasn't sold off as much as you would think, and that's why there hasn't been the rotation, because they think in the event the policies become right and there's confidence in the economy, uh, the, the corporates are doing well. But they don't really believe the inflationary story. That's what's starting to happen. They're starting to distrust inflation being really high. It is moving up, definitely moving up. Mm. But it's just this total inflation story around what will be the, the absolute rate for 10 years, and it's a distrust around Donald Trump being yeah, able to is, do the inflation, do the sort of story. Because the, the soft data is there. The soft yeah. data is actually highlighting the consumer confidence, etc. cetera, the, the, you know, the PMIs are coming through, but the hard data is still lagging. The hard data is mm. not there, and I think that's what the bond market's looking at. Yeah, I mean, I think you see that wages growth is, is quite... It's, it's starting to move up, but when you consider how hard you've beaten it, uh, you've beaten it with a pretty strong monetary stick and there's nothing really happening. So it's then how does it play out? I, I think there's an element that says to me it's corporate America has learnt the lessons of the GFC and, and probably consumer America has learnt it and they're all hard lessons. And I don't think feel they, they feel that comfort around getting a wage rise and I think they think that when Trump does what he wants to do with tax, it won't trickle down. I mean, that's the challenge. Mm. How do you interpret the Trump rally? Do you <laughs> feel... Uh, it makes sense, or do you think there's going to be a rebalancing around that inflation, that reflation? I rally? think Keith said it before complacency. That's what concerns me the most, is the complacency in the States where there seems to be this belief that um, Donald Trump will be able to... First, there's the reflationary trade, but he will be able to spur on um, real economic growth from one and a half to two percent, uh, back up to about four through infrastructure spend and other things. Well, economic growth comes from two things: productivity growth and from um, uh, an increase in the the working populace. We haven't seen any productivity growth since 2006. Correct. That's exactly right. In fact, there are things such as Moore's law that are starting to break down the technology space that suggests that we're not going to see um, productivity growth in, in quite a while. Now, infrastructure spend, yes, it will lead to greater productivity at some point in the future, but to double real GDP growth? I don't think so. Um, 
so then it has to come from population growth. Yeah. Well, unless somebody invents a time machine and goes back 25 years and suddenly massively repopulates the world with now working age people, we're going to have to rely on immigration. And does anybody think there's going to be an increase in immigration in the US with the Donald Trump presidency? Probably not. So I think the market's been complacent around how much um, economic growth will actually be realised with the stimulatory effects that he's putting in place. Mm -hmm. Look, um, corporate businesses that are currently paying a corporate tax rate of roughly 30-odd percent, if he is able to enact tax cuts down to 20, that will be a, a kick straight to the bottom line. And so they will be more profitable, right? Are you saying that that tax cut will not be paid in wages and will not go to more employment? Is that what you're saying? Oh, it, it may do. Some of I don't it think may. it will. I, think, no, I, don't, I, I don't think it will. I, I think don't. most of it will... Yeah, I, I don't think all of it will. Um, the same yeah. way that technological advancement doesn't necessarily lead to businesses being more profitable, um, it might lead to people being able to do more stuff for business. Well, we're going to take a hard break, because I've been told by Caitlin that it's a hard break. That means she's going to hang up on me. So uh, we'll take a hard break. That'll be our second break, and then we'll talk about the Trump rally and the trickle-down effect and what will happen in the politics of the trickle-down effect. We'll talk to you soon. Macca's hash brown bites for two dollars. It's a snack-sized twist on our famous hash brown, with golden crust and steamy potatoey goodness. Bite into eight of them today for only two dollars. At Officeworks, we don't just say lowest prices; we try to live them. A 100-pack of Lowell A4 laminating pouches protects your documents and your budget. A low $14.47. This 1,000 pack of DL peel and seal envelopes delivers on price just $18.96. And a 110 pack of finished dishwashing tablets leaves your dishes clean only $19.80. At Officeworks, we live lowest prices. If you've got the big ideas, Officeworks has the lowest prices. It's Kitchen Week at the Good Guys. Get big brands, big appliances and big deals. Find a lower advertised price, we'll beat it. Kitchen Week is now on. Pay less, we'll beat it at The Good Guys. If your goal is to retire right, AMP can help with expert advice to make the most of the super changes before July 1. Visit amp.com.au slash superchanges. The multi-awarded Hyundai i30 is in run out, and they're running out fast. Now with a free $2,000 gift card on selected i30 models. Run in today before we run out. Enough said. Mm, delicious Angus beef, sizzling bacon, a hint of truffle, and parmesan cheese. It's the new Angus truffle and cheese. That's the drive through The Macca's Gourmet Creations range. Now available in drive through It's the fast, easy way to gourmet. Team Invest goal is simple. Educate investors to take their returns to a new, higher level by using the proven strategies of the world's greatest investor. After all, Warren Buffett's track record is 70 times better than the US market performance. For a limited time, Proven Principles, the secret of Warren Buffett's success, is available now and free to download. To take your investment performance to a new, higher level, Proven Principles is essential reading. Don't struggle with your investment decisions or pay others to do a very average job. Download your copy of Proven Principles now. And when you learn how to identify wealth winners and to avoid capital killers, you can generate more from your investments than you ever Ever imagined. Here's the proof. Using proven principles, disciplined investors can average 15% per annum compound total returns. That turns $1 million into $4 million in just 10 years. To get your free copy of Proven Principles and to learn how to transform your investment performance, go to provenprinciples.com.au today. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. It's Mark Todd with a very noisy computer. I'm at the NAB. Uh, again, if you want to talk to me directly, it's mark.todd at nab.com.au if you're listening on the podcast. Uh, I've got Dan Miles from Innova and I've got Keith Jones from uh, Affinity Wealth 
here to answer any of your questions, so feel free to call us. It's 1300 30 34 35. The email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. We have our second email for the night, and it's from Jenny. Um, and Jenny says, with comparative advantage being eroded so quickly, are growth stocks a good place to be in today's rapidly disrupting world, or are we better to be higher up the capital structure? Uh, I started with you last time, I'll go with you this time. Are, are we being disrupted in growth stocks? And as a consequence, should you go up the capital stack or, or how do you think? And I know that you don't know all of Jenny's um, personal circumstances and she should get advice. Uh, but at the same time, let's say, she says, I don't want to pay for advice right now. I want to see what you would say and then mm -hmm. she might decide to go and get advice. Um, it all comes down to the price you pay at the end of the day. Um, growth stocks and uh, whether or not the companies in, that you have invested in you're classifying as growth stocks um, could potentially be competed away and therefore aren't going to generate the level of earnings um, that you think they will in the future. Well, if you've overpaid for them, yeah, no, you wouldn't want to be in them. And yes, you yep. would, I would rather be up the capital structure. It all depends on what you've paid for them, though. Um, if you've gotten them cheap enough, even the, worst in, even the worst company in the world, if you get it cheap enough, you can still sell it for slightly more than what you paid. It could have been a decent investment. Everything comes down to price. Everything always comes back to the actual price you paid. Um, okay. So it's not always just the fundamentals of the business. It really comes down to how much you paid for it. Okay, your thoughts? Yeah, well, I agree. And and come on, to, to answer the listen. Question. Well, I'm going to put you can a little be bit Smith, you can be Coley. <laughs> can I have a little <laughs> bit of attention? I'll be the I'll be yeah, the referee. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say that look, right now, going back to your comments down earlier in the night about uh, the sector rotation that's happening in the market, what we've actually seen is people coming out of growth, especially smaller yeah, stocks, moving into the bigger resource stocks like BHP, etc., and the banks. And so, if anything, now is probably a time to start looking through some of that carnage that's gone in the, in the small cap sector. In fact, you could almost argue that the last six to eight months have been a bear market in the small cap sector. Even companies that have been generating good earnings, meeting or beating uh, expectation, have still been sold off as that money rotates out. So, um, I think there's an opportunity there in the short to medium term to pick up some good quality businesses with good strong earning profiles. I do think that you should be up the capital stack for a portion of your biz your portfolio that you don't really want to put at risk. So yeah. I think you move up the capital yeah. stack and then make a decision. I hear what Dan's saying about price. I think it's also a, a position on what you're prepared to risk. So is it 5% of your capital, 10% of your capital? Because you, we, we just don't know where price yeah, is going. Yeah, it comes back to setting the rules at the beginning, right? Define that rule. If you can take a 10%, if you can take 10% of your capital and put it in growth and hope that the management gets it right, great. If you say, no, no, I'm fine with 50%, that's great. But if you are unsure, you then move up the capital stack and work out how much you need to get in your conservative bucket. Is it a 5% return that gives you comfort? And I think you can get that in conservative strategies. And then you say, OK, that's that piece done, and I'm OK with that. I'll sleep. Now I want to look at, you know, things that have beaten up, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so, Jenny, it's a great email. Thank you for taking the time to write it. Uh, the other thing I wanted... We were doing the Trump yep. narrative. I am of the view, without wanting to dominate the whole thing, the trickle-down effect meant that economic rationalism didn't work for the voters that voted for Trump. They felt that they weren't benefiting, they want their jobs to come back. I really don't think they want to stand on the factory queue. I, I think they just want to have their communities back because people left to go and take other jobs. What happens if the, if the Donald Trump voters find that if he gives tax cuts, they don't get the benefit, they don't get higher wages, they don't get more jobs? What happens at an electoral level? Well, look, just stepping back a little bit, re the the actual impact of the tax cut. So the tax cut's supposed to stimulate investment. By paying less tax, companies in the US have got more cash flow, they've got more cash on balance sheet, therefore they should look to uh, deploy that cash flow, and normally that would be in productive assets that they can get a return on that's higher than holding cash. That's yep. the basic concept. Won't mm -hmm. happen. The big problem with the whole argument is that corporate America hasn't had a cash flow problem. It's yeah. been throwing off up until you know, the last year where, where, where a lot of cash has been taken up on share buybacks, it's had record amounts of cash flow. It's record margins. But what it's been doing is taking the, that cash flow and buying back its stock. So we've had share buybacks. So to me, 
if you cut the tax rate, the first thing that's going to happen is buybacks are going to be stimulated again. Now, what does that mean for equity markets? Well, it means more underpinning equity markets, but what does it mean for the mum and dad or the middle class America that's looking to get their their, their uh, manufacturing job back or their skilled trade job back, well, I don't think it's going to eventuate. And even the jobs that are coming back, which are pro-Trump jobs, uh, they're going into technology-driven sectors, they're going into manufacturing that's leveraging off technology. So I just don't think the jobs are going to be there. And Ash, if you're still w um, watching, uh, that's part of the answer to your question in terms of if you get higher bond yields, why is the equity market still going the way they go? It's because the tax cuts, no one really believes it's going to the workers. No one believes it's going to, to extra hours. Nope. What they think is going to happen is it's going to get you, as a shareholder, for better dividends. Correct. Mm. Higher dividends. 100% uh, correct. Any other point in terms of the Trump things? Like, what should people look for? If we're saying the risk is in the execution, is there anything you're po thinking about in terms of a catalyst for change around, hang on, I don't believe it's going to be inflationary. Is there anything that you could see in you know, the legislative framework that's taking place over the next couple of weeks, if you could say to the viewers, well, watch out for that. Oh, no, nothing particularly, because what, what I try to do is understand um, uh, outcomes that could occur and then how I could potentially profit from them, from them instead of trying to understand, well, if I see this signal, it need, leads to this result, so therefore I'll trade this, this position. That's very rare that I can get that right or those positions um, pay off. So, look... As far as domestic consumers, things that I'm concerned about are things like uh, our reliance on um, the commodity prices for favourable terms of trade. Um, that's yep. a fairly risky position for us to be in. So um, if somebody's looking for things, that's what they'd be looking for. Um, instead, we're trying to find positions in portfolios where we think, look, um, there is a chance that we may lead to higher inflation. In an inflationary yep. environment, my concern is that if people have fixed rate, long duration bonds and equities in their portfolio and it does start to hit the discount rate, both of those parts of the portfolio start to sell off. So what don't they own? You talked about owning um, different components of the capital structure. I completely agree. The bond market is just this rich tapestry where you have fixed and floating different areas of the capital structure that uh, domestic, offshore, there is so much that you can do with it and there are so many different ways that you can construct components of your portfolio that will either protect you or do well in different regimes. The whole point is that most people can't predict those regimes. What you want to do is when uh, one looks more likely than another or there's a higher risk in one area than another because the price is too high, maybe own more of something than something else, which is why... Um, the question earlier about why um, asset managers haven't rotated out of equities into um, government bonds, I am one of those guys and I have not moved into long duration government bonds because I still see a big left tail risk that could kill people. What I have been holding not is... Not quite kill. Everyone's <laughs> yeah, calm, <laughs> it's not quite kill. Well, you just won't perform as well as somebody else. If you got a 3% it... government bond and didn't sell it, yeah. you would get 3%. You wouldn't be dead. Okay? <laughs> you wouldn't be able to tell yeah, everyone you how smart you were. You see your capital value eroding. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. you have to that's sell a, it, and that's, that's not why you went into it. So yeah. I, I get it. OK, keep going. Um, Don't stop for me. Um, but, uh, you know, things such as, um, you know, unsecured debt, floating rate notes, um, we've been owning those in the portfolio. We looked very silly, you know, three years ago, two years ago, um, but have looked a lot smarter of late um, owning those in the portfolio because, look, we're just concerned that you need to have things in your portfolio in case inflation comes through. It doesn't mean it will. We have our first caller for the night. Um, we have Brandon from Victoria about dividend imputation now. Brandon, how can we help you? I was, I was just going to throw over to the panel... America could solve all their problems if they did uh, dividend imputation. Then all Apple shareholders would be screaming like hell to get their hundred billion on the shore, pay the tax, and they wouldn't have to adjust the tax rate at all. They're just <laughs> going to drop the tax rate, and they don't pay any tax anyway. So no one's going to be better off. It's a really good point, Brandon. Um, I. My, my response to that is I think everyone wants a singular answer to a more complex problem, which is America is becoming the rogue state. And that's the challenge. How does middle America become relevant when the East and the West are doing so well? And it's the middle part of America is trying to say, I want, I want, I want. And they have got some 
real fiscal challenges around how they're going to it's, stimulate their... And it's fair their, enough, yes. to be perfectly frank. It's fair enough Absolutely. that they're saying, I want... Absolutely. They, they haven't benefited, and and it's about the GFC continues to sit in their pathway, and they haven't... The, the corporate America is... You know, people have been paid hundreds of millions of dollars, and, and it's, it's creating a real challenge around how people will accept that as being mm. the right number. Mm. And I just don't think they're going to do that. Well, I think that goes back to Dan's comment before. I mean, it's, it, wealth has become about financialization rather than productivity growth. Yeah, and, and, and true wealth is through productivity growth. It's not through artificially pump priming markets. Um, that's the issue. So, so Brandon's right. There are definitely strategies that the government could do, and that sounds like a very good one. You could do yeah, that. It's a very that, logical that, one. That's you... a great logic. You know, that's logical. Yeah. And then as you apply that, they become illogical because it's an <laughs> illogical world they put it into, and it's a Congress. So it's a bit nutty. And when you think about the US right now, they're trying to revoke Obamacare and uh, they want a new Affordable Care Act. And it, that's been in, in... You know, the Obamacare's been for about six years, and the Republican Party don't have a health act. They don't have a they don't have a policy. Mm. So I'm I'm concerned around how the logjam, you know, starts to impact. So the Fed lifted rates this year, this sorry, this month. We now have a global idea that rates are going high. Can you see rates here, Europe? You just come from Chile, had a holiday in Chile. Mm. Can you see globally rates going high following the US? No, look, I for all the reasons we've spoken about tonight you know, with the soft data leading, which is, you know, sort of unleashing those animal spirits, which has also come off the back of a big stimulus from China last year, which has flowed through into commodity markets, etc., and sort of underpinned um, global markets. At the same time, we've had this, you know, uh, recycling from the inventory draw that we had for the prior 18 months to that stimulus. I think that sort of put a backdrop in for, for some growth, and that's what we're seeing now, this sort of final flurry in the late cycle. Um, for me, I would say that maybe there will be two rate, rate hikes, as the Fed is actually, you know, proposing, because they want to lift those rates. They want to get off the off the floor, so they've got some ammunition when yep. you do actually turn, when we, we do actually have a recession. But I can't see it going further than that. I think we're having a late stage rally. Uh, sorry, late stage soft recovery in economic data and I question whether it's going to have the momentum to take us through into future years and for that reason I think that rates will stay fairly benign okay. um, and same in, in Australia I, th I don't see rates moving at all this year because on what basis yep mm. um, okay can you there's a there's a two-part question can you see rates going higher and have you thought about the fact that the Fed has got three vacant seats that uh, the President Trump will put people into, mm. and that when the Fed says in 2018, 2019, this is where we see the rates, the reality is the Fed chairman will probably not be Chairman Yellen. Yellen. The deputy chair will probably not be the deputy chair. Uh, Fisher will probably go, though they could still be Fed members. D do you think rates go higher, and have you thought about how rates might be under a Trump world with a Trump presidencies and federal, you know, federal presidents. Yeah, we have. We, I have, but we don't spend an enormous amount of time uh, trying to figure out what the results will be because I don't have a crystal ball that's any clearer than anyone else's. But, yeah, um, I don't think there's any question that the that Fed will raise rates. Um, it's a question of um, the magnitude um, and when, I guess, more than anything else. Um, and then from our point of view and for the viewer's point of view, what does that actually mean for asset markets? I think what will stop Fed from raising rates is if we see a big sell-off in equity markets. Mm. Yep. They seem to, the, the Fed's got a dual mandate, right, to control inflation and for full employment. Well, yeah. apparently they got a third one but after the GSC, and that's to inflate asset prices. And so if asset prices fall, I think they probably want a few bullets in the chamber to be able to, uh, to, to drop them or at least stop rate rises at some point in the future. I think there's no question that there'll be rate rises. Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? I don't know. Um, there's no question that inflation is now feeding through into the state, so they should be raising rates. But how does it play back here to the people watching this? How yeah, does so that domestically, play back into us? Look, I have an opinion on rates here in Australia, but it's not worth a whole lot. Um, I think they will probably stay... He's disclaimed away. OK, you've got 30 <laughs> seconds to give us your actual I think, view. I think they'll be... I think they'll be... I think they'll stay steady. Yeah. Um... Uh, look, I, uh, the Australian... How does that feed through to the, the Australian equity market? Well, the Australian equity market's not ridiculously expensive or cheap. It's just OK. Um, and so I guess 
it, a, an equity market sell-off in the States if something happens will definitely have a contagion effect here. I don't think there's any question of that. Um, and so that's what I would be looking to. I don't think it'll be rates domestically that will cause any change in our, in our investment markets. I'll we'll just go to our inflation. final break, but keep that thought. Hang on. Yeah. We have to have our final break for the night because Caitlin will give it to me. I'll take a quick break and then we'll come back with more uh, of the Coley Smith entourage. Talk to you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Clever. Clever. Tall. Yeah. Clever. 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 Clever you. <laughs> New NAB Rewards. A clever little card. NAB. More than money. Not well, mate. You gotta do something. Inspiration's paint. Yes. Oh, it's loungy, our lounge room paint project. Right this way. Yeah, there, there, boy. I think loungy here needs lots of fresh ideas and attention. Tell me about your lounge room. Old Federation, high ceilings, and dado rails. What about um, an industrial meets Oxford scale? What type of floor is it? Uh, polished floorboards. Great. Brick wallpaper in the top section. Dark colour down low. I'll take you through each step to make sure you get a great finish. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Vic. Hi, Lungy. Kitchy. If your goal is to retire right, AMP can help with expert advice to make the most of the super changes before July 1. Visit amp.com.au slash superchanges. Mm, delicious Angus beef, sizzling bacon, a hint of truffle and parmesan cheese. It's the new Angus truffle and cheese. That's the drive through The Macca's Gourmet Creations range. Now available in drive through it's the fast, easy way to gourmet. The zip transformation of ordinary water begins with micropurity filtration. The water is then rapidly cooled in our direct dry chilling system for delicious chilled and sparkling water instantly. You can also enjoy perfectly heated boiling water with our integrated Power Pulse innovation. Only the smart technology of Zip Hydro Tap can instantly bring you water in a form you will love. All from one classically designed tap. Earn 80,000 bonus points with the new NAB Rewards Platinum Card, which you could use with Webjet for a return flight from Sydney to Auckland. New NAB Rewards. A clever little card. Clever. NAB. More than money. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from the NAB. I'm joined by Keith Jones from Affinity, Dan Miles from Innova. It is the final segment, but it's still time to call us. Uh, the phone number 1300 30 34 35. The email is yourmoney@scornews.com.au. And as I often say, mark.todd at nab.com.au. If you are listening to the podcast and anything triggers a response, even if it's a negative response, it'll all happen. You know, I've, I've had some abusive emails. Uh, I mentioned climate change once, and boy, that flew. Uh, <laughs> and I mentioned it in the positive. How do you educate clients? So when, I'm, when I think about the education story that you both have to do, it, it's clear that you've got to educate clients, not just in their meeting their outcomes. OK, Dan, Keith, I want to have 15% returns. Do not hold your breath. Um, I want to buy things that are not risky. Hang on, what do you think is not risky? So how do you go about the education when you're talking about How do you set the conversation up? How do you do that? Um, I, I think it's about starting with the client's objectives. And I think we've pretty much covered that today. I mean, that's, that's very important. And then it's working back through where okay, risks sit in the I'll be more granular. Let's yeah. say I, I, we bring a bond 
and you say, that's great, that's a great opportunity, or a REIT. I, REITs yeah. are all bad. You know, you see it in the yeah. press, REITs are all bad, and you go, hang on, yeah. Property, there's more bonds, than one hybrids, type REIT, hybrids, and, there's, and, yeah. there's all, you know, and, and yeah. hybrids are all bad, and of course, yeah. so that's what I'm talking about. How do you deal with the white noise and then say to people, you've just got to understand these fundamentals? How do you do that? You just got, I think, like, if we're talking about a sector like fixed interest, then we try to talk about the, 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 the broad basics of fixed interest. A lot of clients don't actually want to get that granular. Some do, but a lot don't. That's why they've come to you as an advisor yeah, right. for you to okay. build that. Mm -hmm. But they still need to understand how those mechanisms work and how they relate. So, for example, bonds versus hybrids, what's the difference? You know, what's the risks, etc.? What's the benefits? So, in terms of equities, it's really about educating the clients through about um, equity cycles more than anything else uh, you know really try to drive that home and the principles of when an equity market is fully valued even though it can keep on moving maybe it's an opportunity to reduce some of your risk exposure in the in the in the short medium term likewise when markets are you know cyclically deep is actually an opportunity to increase your exposure so just just little strategies like that can help the client understand okay. what the, you know how you're managing the portfolios but it's an ongoing process mark and for you, you we, you've brought a chart. Yeah. Don't buy high yield credit. Uh, yeah, of course, never buy high yield you, bonds. You, everyone told people not to do that. What's happened? How do I read this chart that you've brought in? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I hear stories all the time that high yield or junk bonds are a really bad investment because they have unlimited downside and limited upside. Yeah. So I like to test theses. So this is uh, the return of. Um, uh, the high yield Barclay, Bloomberg Barclays High Yield um, Bond Index uh, hedged back to Australian dollars yep. compared to the ASX 200 with all dividends reinvested. And I chose the ASX 200 because it's one of the best performing equity markets over that period. And you can see the returns, and it's done so with two thirds of the volatility, right? And only two thirds of the drawdown in the GFC. So, so there the are misconceptions. White line, the folks that are looking at the white line is the bond, the high yield uh, bond market, if you can't read that and the total returns, so it's rallied, and both have rallied, but if mm. you can see, the the level of movement in the orange line is, is what Dan's talking about. It's about what's the volatility. One is a more steady line, and the other one is a much more volatile within each intraday, if you think about it. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And so, um, we, yeah, so we we talk to clients about um, where in the capital structure they sit. We One of the things we use for education is try to um, tell them, try to get them to understand the fundamental reason why they should be paid a return for owning the investment that they own. Like, why should you actually get something for owning this thing? Um, and junk bonds are a classic example where you're sitting slightly above the equity in the capital structure and you say, well, they carry a similar sort of risk to equities, but it all comes down to price as well, right? So I wouldn't be buying junk bonds right now. I wouldn't go anywhere near them because the option adjusted spread on them is about 4% yep. over. But that doesn't mean I wouldn't always I wouldn't always say that. I mean, the chart clearly shows that there are periods of time that it makes a lot of sense to, to own them. But yeah. to write them off outright because, you know, the word junk is at the front of bonds doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. So we first understand why you should get paid an economic benefit for owning an asset and then try and assess what is the price of that asset. I just want to let everyone know, I mean, I'm, I've been telling people this uh, ad nauseum, so I'll tell everyone on the show ad nauseum. Uh, investment grade credit, so if you think about a corporate, uh, for the people that might be looking at this, think of a hybrid, if you bought the CBA Pearls 9, that's that's investment, that's not investment grade, but that is a credit, you're lending CBA money at 400, that's the sort of story that you're looking at. The margin is 400 over the cash rate. So. Uh, investment grade credit in the US, year to date, so they they're, they're do calendar years, it's three, about $324 billion mm -hmm. over those three months. <clears throat> it's about 11% more than it was in 2016, and that was a stellar year. All the money, and if it's $324 billion in investments, they probably had, you know, a trillion dollars in dollars spent. Mm -hmm. People couldn't, you know, went, put $100 down, then they got $25. All the money at the moment is going into credit because it's because it seems to me, and I'm no expert, but it seems to me that they're letting the equities run and they're saying, I'm just, I'd am just i rather lend to you because I'm going slightly above the equity, but I'm, I know that you'll pay back my debts and if you don't, I can then inflict some pain on you. It seems to me that everyone's going to credit. 
I think there has been a rotation into credit, and that's partly the answer to, again, the question that we had earlier. People haven't gone into government bonds. They've come out of some of the equities and into the credit, and Harvard you can see them in the rally. There's a big appetite for issuance over there as well because of the buybacks. Um, Centra did, like, $500 million. Uh, um, we did a pipeline. They did 850 uh, You know, it's there's massive... And that's just mm. in one day. Mm. Tell me about the property market. We've got, we've got a minute to go for each of you. Um, What's your thoughts on property at the moment? Well, a, a few weeks ago, I quite liked the REITs because they'd pulled back quite a lot. So, uh, And I still think the selective REITs are quite nice. But we, we, we move really in the commercial property space, so property syndication uh, in that area. And typically, we look for properties where they've, they've got some fleas so you can add value. Yeah, yeah, right. I'm not really, at the, in this part of the cycle, really looking to invest in commercial property that's passive. Yep. You know, there has to be an, a value add in there. Uh, simply because of the cap rates at the moment. Mm. We're not sure which way they'll go. So I still like property, uh, particularly like commercial property. I don't like residential property, but right. I do like commercial and, and some retail property. Uh, 30 seconds. You were talking about the Bridgewater... Um, all weather. When we're all on weather. Thursday, so, yeah. so let's have a quick... 30 seconds on, on what it is, so people might be able to follow it and, and understand the yeah. themes behind it. The 30-second uh, the version, um, uh, essentially as a concept, don't follow it exactly because they the way they execute, they leverage into bonds and you don't want to do that. But they talk about um, understanding different regimes or states and assume that, well, we can't predict them. So what assets can we own that will make money in each of those states so that that's why they call it all weather, irrespective of the conditions, whether we have high or low GDP growth, high or low inflation, they have assets that will make money in each of those four buckets. So I'm sure you'll find that on Google. It's the Bridgewater all weather strategy. Um, that's all we have time for tonight. I want to thank our guests. We've had Keith Jones from Affinity. He's been great. And Dan Miles, of course, at Innova has been fantastic. To you, the viewers, and the calls and emails have been great. If you missed any of the show and want to listen again or catch up on any of the program, go to your favourite podcast platform and search for Sky News, Your Money, Your Call, Bonds. Hopefully it'll be there. Uh, enjoy your weekend. All the best. Take care. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.